Whose game is it anyway? A pertinent question during these COVID times and even beforehand, somewhat rhetorical. I'm Guy Clark. Thanks for joining us here on the Blood Red channel for a special podcast as we explore that very question. I'm joined by our business of football writer at The Echo, Dave Powell, an award-winning sports writer and Sunday Times best-selling author, Michael Calvin, whose latest book, Whose Game Is It Anyway?, launches on Monday the 19th of April and explores football's role in our lives and how distant, in particular, the game seems to have become during the pandemic to many of us. Mike, thanks a lot for uh, for joining us. Um, it, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. Uh, could you just sort of lead us into the book itself and uh, and the topics it does explore? Uh, okay, okay, yeah, great to be here. Um, in, in essence, I suppose the pandemic has been a time for all of us uh, to self-reflect in, in you know a whole range of areas of our lives. Um, you know, football has been continuing in a void, um, an emotional void, and the game has always you know, spoken to me very emotionally. It's been it's been something which has enriched my life emotionally and professionally. And it, it was, I suppose, the book. The genesis of the book was the death of my father-in-law um, through COVID uh, last May. Um, there was an outbreak in his care home in, in Devon. Just before uh, he died, um, he he'd had uh, accelerated vascular dementia. And so the, the curtains across his mind were being drawn. But in the last couple of days before he passed, um, he became quite lucid when, funnily enough, my wife talked to him about football. And he recalled being a 10, 11 year old boy uh, walking al along the terrace streets of, of, of West Watford, where he lived, to watch, to, to watch the local club. Um, and football meant a sweet shop on a Saturday, it meant the anticipation of the game, the, the size of the stadium. And he spoke as an old man about what the game had meant, not just to him, but to his father. And that had real relevance after he passed. We found a box in one of his sheds, a wooden box, which was full of his father's um, woodworking tools. And on in on the inside of the box was a, um, uh, there were three fixture lists from the 32-33 season. Filled in pencil, obviously by his father, photograph of a, a very young footballer and a very, very small thumbnail photograph. And I just I was intrigued by that. Why did his father put it on there? Was it actually my father-in-law? And I, I, I never quite got to it. I suspected it could have been. But what that spoke to me was that that was at a time where, you know, I don't know about you guys, but. I'd fallen in, I'd fallen out of love with football, and what it represented—the hyper commercialization, the, the the innate cynicism of the game, and the way it was moving and being exploited—you know—in in, in the fields that Dave would know that the, you know the vulture capitalism that's coming into the game, and I I then resolved to look back over my life through sport. I've been you know ridiculously lucky, you know I've watched international sport over by me 40 years in more than 80 countries and you know met some amazing people and done some you know um pretty special things for me anyway um and i i wanted to go back through my experiences to try and work out one why i fell in love with football and two how i could fall in love with it again and then so go back come up to the present which is looking at what will the game look like post pandemic what are the key issues that need to be addressed and who are the individuals who give me hope for the future it's i, I found the, the the book to touch on your, your, your first point mark it, it resonated with me because i lost my father a couple of years ago um and uh football was always kind of the the, the glue that bound us i suppose i mean we we had our interests were, were dissimilar in every other area as, aside from um, supporting Chester, which is what we did. So, um, and, and I was kind of introduced to it at a very young age, um, followed them up and down the country, and um, it, it, it became the topic of all our conversations and our, our reason for 
linking up, especially in later life, as, as kind of lives move in different directions and, and you know, kind of children arrive and and things like this. It was still the um, it was still what kept us kind of good friends. So so I found the book really resonated in that in that respect. But then it then it I say I kind of started thinking about how the game is changing. Um, do, do you? A lot of people point to, I mean, I've, because I've supported a, a football team outside of um, the Premier League for <laughs> for my entire life, um, it, it, I've always kind of felt detached from that element of um, seeing that huge change that the kind of Premier League brought around. Was that is that the first kind of block in terms of football changing for you, or is it? And everything now is it seems to be accelerated. Um, in, in the past eighteen months, two years, to a point which it's almost unrecognisable with VAR and um, obviously empty stadiums are, are a result of the pandemic. But but what do you point? What, do you, what how do you see the timeline kind of, kind of of the game changing um, in English football at the top level? Do you think the Premier League was the kind of the catalyst for it all? I I think obviously it's a it's a massively significant milestone. You know. Football is cyclical, isn't it? I suppose you go back to the '60s, the the introduction of the the minimum wage. Um, you know, I I went into football professionally late '70s. You know, was able to, you know, I met Shankly before before he died, and um, um you know. <laughs> You know, in our profession, you don't really, you know, it's not, it's sort of infradig to ask for autographs. And I've done it about, I've done it three times and I did it with Shanks. I did it with uh, Nelson Mandela and, and Pele. And uh, that's, that's a fair, that's a fair, fair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably fair, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, sorry, I know that was a bit of a humble brag. I'm sorry, boys. But, um, you know, it was like, I just, I thought, oh my word, you know, um, I, actually, I gave him a. He, he'd done an album, a double album, vinyl of of him talking about football, and it absolutely was spellbinding stuff. And I, I, um, it, I was mortified because I gave him a pen to you know sort of do the best wishes, Bill Shankly type of thing on it, and the damn pen ran out after after the first two words. So the so the interview is by sorry the um the autograph is is the first two words are in blue uh, black and the, and the rest are in blue. It looks ridiculous but <laughs> you know it was the way he spoke about football and I and I bring that up because there is this sort of you know the mythology is that football didn't exist before 1992. Well it did. You know I watched football it was an era in which i watched football in you know behind the iron curtain where we we as journalists used the access that football gave us i know they say we work in the toy department but basically we were able to go into countries which were like so for instance into into poland when poland was under martial law i was i managed to get in there with the england under 21 team the international brotherhood of journalism then took over the local journals got us access to solidarity the the, the the political activists did one of the most bizarre interviews of my life actually in a confessional in the in the arch cathedral in warsaw where the the activist was on the other side of the of the gauze you know where the where the priest usually was so um you know there was an awful lot and football began to be shaped in the 80s you know i i, got, I was called in by thatcher after the heisel uh, and I saw there, I, I left Downing Street that day full of dread for what football was going to be confronted by, which is a mixture of political ignorance and, ag and, and, and arrogance, which, which endures to this day. So, so much happened. So many formative things happened even before the Premier League. But, but you, you're right, Dave, that the, the introduction of, of not just the league itself, but what the league represents, which is elitism, hyper-commercialism, a move away from the game that we fell in love with as kids, which is, you know, I, I, we you know come up to the, the, the current day. I had a, a chat with a, uh, a friend of mine the other day, um, West Ham fan, and he, he was talking, obviously, you know, as we said right at the start, the pandemic has changed the way we think about certain things. And he was saying, well, look, for me to go to a home game at the Olympic Stadium, 
Um, I always call it the Olympic Stadium just because it upsets the West Ham owners. Um, but if you look at if you look at that, he said it, that I take my son to that game. We travel down on the train. We live in sort of um, in you know, Bedfordshire, Buckinghamshire area. Um, have a couple of pints for the game. Have something to eat afterwards. So for me and my lad, that's two hundred and fifty quid for a game out a, a day out of the football. Now, one, that's economically unsustainable, I think. But two, he's, he said, look, I'm in the stadium, which I hate. It's this big bowl. Like so many modern stadia, it's got the feel of a superstore. Well, you know, I don't know if I really want to be a part of that anymore. And I do think, you know, bringing it up to date, you know, who wants a Super Bowl? You know, who is, it's interesting now, you know, as we're speaking, fans are beginning to to, to militate in a way and, and work collectively. We don't, you know, there are the fans of the big six clubs or what, you know, the perceived big six clubs, they don't want the Super League. They don't want this endless, sterile, uh, self-serving um, competition which replaces the Champions League, which I feel is 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 still, it's not perfect, but I think it's it's you know you look at you know we're we're talking at a time where we've just had um, some I think some terrific quarterfinals that PSG Bayern game those, those, those two games are fantastic you know so you know whose game is it anyway well I think it's the fans game and it, I think the fans have got more latent power than they probably realise, or maybe they're in the process of realising it, and it might have taken the sort of social and cultural earthquake of, of COVID for, for them to understand, look, it doesn't have to be this way. We don't have to be um, trampled underfoot by you know, people who've got no intrinsic uh, attraction to the game beyond the fact that it can enrich them beyond the riches that they already possess. Yeah, on that on that point there, on 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 sort of the supporters, and I suppose we've really seen that sort of exacerbated with games going behind closed doors. I mean, certainly with Liverpool, think back to the Barcelona game. Everybody, even immediately from then, said the four nil never happens without the supporters. In this last week, of course, Real Madrid have come to Anfield, and albeit a good performance, I think if the fans were maybe at Anfield, we could well have seen a different result and Liverpool get a couple of goals. But I suppose it is one of those where the fans realise their power, yet the game is all about the broadcasting and the money brought into it. Project Restart, for example, wasn't brought around for the good of Liverpool sealing a first league title in 30 years, was it? It was the broadcasters trying to claw back what money they could from, obviously, the the football being suspended and stopped. True enough, but I think also you've got to look at the people who are in charge of the bigger clubs, you know, the the Glazers at Manchester United. You know, Fenway have just had this half a half a billion pounds worth of, of investment from people who aren't in it for their health. Let's let's be honest. You know, uh, Stan Kroenke uh, is worth six billion pounds because he he bloodlessly exploits professional sport in all its forms, both in North America and 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 now obviously over here with Arsenal. So I think we've got a breed of people owning football clubs who essentially, you know, they're owning, they're owning widgets, basically. They really are very, very you know, lucrative widgets. I think they might be overreaching themselves in something like a Super League um, because, as I said earlier, I do feel that they're post-pandemic. Um, I think there is, there's been a, there's, there's been a, there's been an emotional shift, I think, people and, and financial shift. People are saying, Look, I can go down to my local non-league club. You know, let's say, in, let's say on Merseyside, you know, you know, going down to Marine or somewhere like that, where you, you, it's a, it's a it's a really nice community club. It's a it's a collective experience. It doesn't cost you the earth. You can pay I don't know eight quid to get in, have a couple of pints with your mate if you want to change your change ends at half time. Terrific. Whereas if you go to a, a Premier League game, it's over stewarded. It's it it's distant. Um, and it's it's a strange it's a, there are so many strange contradictions cropping up at the moment because when you look at it you look at um, 
there's we've got a generation now of of uh, i write about it in the book uh, of of athlete activists we've always looked towards north america for you know the tommy smith's moments the uh, colin kaepernick um you know lebron james was very politically active during the presidential elections over here we've got marcus rashford who has been more politically aware and societally conscious than any politician of any color that you like to mention he's been absolutely inspirational you've raheem sterling who began um working in in, in the cause of of, of anti-racism young football you know liverpool let's let's look at liverpool and and, and trent alexander arnold as the local boy made good if you like which probably explains the emotional intensity of the reaction the reaction when he was dropped by england these are young hugely wealthy footballers with a with a social conscience and that's really important but this is at a time when footballers are essentially marketed as commodities they're all they're, they're chief executives of their own multinational corporations if you like so that, there's that sort of dichotomy there you've then got football clubs who really they should be the beating heart of their communities and they can be you know you look at the the food banks movement again if i use merseyside as an example it's amazingly successful you know we can have a debate about whether that should be really necessary politically but it's a fantastic um example of how a sport in this case football can be uh, an, an, you know, an advantage for society. So there are so many different things swirling around in in um, in the sort of uh, hubbub of, of of you know pandemic life and hopefully post pandemic life. I think football is probably facing an, a fundamentally important decade now. Where do you want to go? Do you want to surrender to? the vacuous um idea of a of a of a of a super league that no one really wants and will have just you know so many redundant matches that people won't watch there are other models out there there, there you know there are the idea for the the, the idea for, i did a documentary for bt sport called ours which was looking at fan run or fan influence clubs and the history of that and i used Berry as an example and actually that documentary came out of my research for for the book where i i went to um to berry to see uh, a guy called james bentley who i wanted to find out what it's like to lose your football club and uh, obviously james uh, james had been a berry fan since he was eight years old and I'd never heard a supporter talk as emotionally, as intently and as eloquently and empathetically about what his football club meant to him. And it's not 11 blokes running around on a pitch, kicking a bit of leather. It's something deep inside him, which is linked into his relationship with his family and his father, his, his great grandfather. We, we did the interview on uh, uh, Bolton Street Station where uh, there was a steam train coming in to go down the valley uh and he was talking about indirectly he was got into football by his great grandfather who essentially instilled the love of the game in his in, in his grandfather and father and it was this this, this his great grandfather went literally went to war in the first world war from that that platform on which we did the interview so that you know what is football it's it, football is identity it's it's family it's not an atm and so many people in charges of, of our of our bigger clubs at the moment are just using football as an atm do you I mean, do, we've talked about um this kind of potential for a, a breakaway super league but where do you stand on on the Champions League reform, which has been presented? Because again, it, it seems like it's a um, whichever way it's it's spun, it's it, the ultimate aim is to to pull the ladder up from um, the rest who aspire to uh, break up the um, the big six, I suppose, or or that kind of group of elite European clubs. Um, it, do, do you think it's 
I mean, 2024, um, Kieran Maguire, who um, a football finance expert, told us it kind of it seemed like it was going to be D-Day for for football, certainly Europe wide. Um, do, do you share that viewpoint? Yeah, I do. I think I think Kieran is is you know a brilliant observer, uh, very acute. Um, incisive observer of the modern game. I agree with him entirely. My view would be, if you want to go, boys, get on with it. You know, get on your bikes. I'm, I, I don't think football needs to actually indulge these people anymore. I think the, the Swiss model is is a you know it's it's a it's a pretty self serving compromise. What is it? I think it's 180 games in the pre knockout phases. Which you know, 180 games more. You, you know, you probably correct me if I'm wrong there, Dave. But certainly, there's an awful lot more. And um, you know, what does that what does that do? It basically gives you just round after round of empty matches. Now, will the broadcasters support it? I think probably in the short term they they probably will. But again, they've got their own challenges. BT Sports, Sky. They are they are the funders of of this football boom, but they the ground is shifting from underneath their feet as well. You know, one of the things that, that I you know wrote write about in the book and when we did the film on as well was how different models are actually generating and different audiences are emerging. You know, so if you're a BT Sport and you pay a billion pounds to 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 promote and 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 feature the prem uh, sorry the Champions League, but you're one of your key demographics, i.e., that young group between eighteen and twenty-five, they don't watch live games. They don't watch ninety minutes. They watch three, four minutes max. So, how does that then? What you know? Because you know, let's let's be, again be honest here. The people who are talking about this so-called Swiss model in twenty twenty-four, who I think shamefully include UEFA, who want to basically jump into bed with the big clubs. They're not going to accept less than they're getting at the moment, but as a different, there's a different game beginning to emerge, or a different audience beginning to emerge. So the one thing that struck me very much and surprised me, you know, because you know, as, as you guys can probably see, I'm sort of in silver fox mode at the moment. You've got guys of different younger generations who are looking at football through a completely different prism. So, you know. You know, as I said, I, you know, I talked about it in the book where you've got hashtag United, hugely successful in terms of social media reach. They've got a bigger social media reach than all but about half a dozen Premier League clubs. And it's essentially they, they, they rev they've, they've sort of reverse engineered it. They don't actually represent a town. They represent an idea. They happen to share a stadium in Essex somewhere. But they have got huge fan loyalty because of the interactivity that they can offer people. You take that one step further. I and I'd never heard, I have to admit, I'd never heard of these guys before actually the guys at hashtag told me about them. They're called the side men. And there are there's seven seven young lads. I, I don't I don't wish to disrespect them by calling them young lads, but you know, they're they're of a certain type. They you know met around London, a um, couple of Man United supporters, you know, isolated down in London. Well, they're not isolated down in London. There's loads of Man United supporters in London, aren't there? But um, he, uh, uh, there's, so there are seven of us, and they, seven of them, and they've just set up a uh, sort of strategic link with Late Norian, who they're driven by a chairman who's influenced by North American culture, their commercial guy comes from the music world. They saw the potential of these guys just in the numbers. And the numbers blew my head off, to be honest, because the seven guys have got a combined YouTube follower for a followership of 110 million people. They've done videos over the last, I think, five or six years. 26 billion, billion views. Now that's an audience that isn't catered for by traditional football. It's not catered for by, um, you know, the you know we 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 are all the match of the day generation, aren't we? The match of the generation, you know, you know these these guys don't watch match of the day. They will watch 
these guys kicking a ball around. They used to do it in the park, but they become so successful that that's one of the, the the driving forces behind their deal with Leighton Orient. That can go, they can go into the ground and do all their football videos on the ground. So, and and in return, this little humble League Two club suddenly gets access to a whole new audience, a lot, you know, uh, a younger demographic, global, you know, and so therefore now they're out there. They're doing deals with you know, Denmark, Italy, the States. That to me is possibly where f football is going to go, and so yeah. To answer a very, very, very long-winded way, Dave, to answer your question, let the plutocrats go. Get on with it, chaps. It, from from what you you were saying there, um, that the investment from from Redbird into FSG very much looks like um, because obviously they. Jerry Cardinal comes into it with a, a huge background in being able to monetize um, certain demographics. Uh, and, and having LeBron James on on board um, in terms of more sway, given his involvement in FSG as opposed to just Liverpool now, seems to point towards maximizing that Nike deal. But um, do you think that that's what this looks like? It, it, it's Fenway's way of trying to monetize that group of um new breed of fans um that may may not access content uh in the way that we traditionally do those who can't go to the games um i mean because they've had huge success red bird in, in the states or, or jerry cardinal has in the states in terms of um making the most out of um that broadcasting relationship um across the new york area and i suppose there's there's myriad opportunities for for them to because Liverpool is such a global brand, it's it's kind of a, a blank canvas, and having some of his expertise seems to point towards that's where this kind of investment might well be used. Yeah, monetize is a great word, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I, you know, I I think probably what intrigues me about that particular deal is almost the the sporting impact of it. You know, I take everything you say, Dave. You know, you, I think you're pretty much spot on with that in terms of maximizing the global reach um, of the group and. Uh, probably giving them, you know, a leg up in in the whole, you know, getting into the sort of Man United strata. Probably, I think what intrigues me about it is that almost like the performance connotations of it. I've always been really impressed, or I mean, recent terms anyway, been very impressed by, uh, you know, Liverpool's recruitment strategy. Um, you know, the the analytic base. The analytical base that that they use, um, I can see that now moving into different areas. You know, AI. Um, so th uh, that's what I'm going to be quite intrigued to see how they use those. Um, you know, basically North American techniques. Um, you know, I did a book called uh, The Nowhere Men, which looked at, at, at scouting and scouts. And funny enough, my, my son's a a, a, a scout. Um, um, worked at uh, worked for uh, Wolves and Norwich. Is now senior um, got a senior role at Middlesbrough. Um, so I've seen scouting evolve over the last you know five to ten years. From you know, there's, there are still the guys who got the eyes, if you like, you know, the guys who can actually smell a footballer. But now those skills are being married with the more modern skills the technology the technological skills um you know my son's of a generation where he's he, he's got a you know he's got a coaching background as well as you know intrinsically he understands the game he can, he can he can spot a player but he's got the tech the, the techie stuff as well there's a new breed of of guys um in sort of like late 20s early 30s who are beginning to um, influence football clubs from within I think you know Liverpool have been ahead of the game and I think they'll probably stay ahead of the game because of Cardinale and and his experience and the innovative nature of of some of um, you know some of the techniques that they've already used in North American sport they can use it they can use you know, I'm fascinated by baseball you know I, I love baseball and um, uh, that is so, it's an easier game it's a more binary game to actually analyze but if you look at the wealth of um 
um, information that is there, you know, the statistical base is so huge. You know, we're now pretty much in the infancy of, of using, you know, analytics. It's, it's obviously now it's pretty prevalent elsewhere, you know, wherever we are. But, I, you know, I so I found it really interesting that, you know, we've had Kevin De Bruyne using a data company okay. to uh, inform his negotiations with Manchester City over a new contract. Didn't need an agent, you know, didn't need a Mino Raiola shouting for the rooftops and, and getting absurd sums of money for doing so. I think that was, that's a really, th again, there are these little things that are happening around the landscape, which I think are hugely significant. And the De Bruyne deal, and, you know, that's then been followed up. Raheem Sterling's doing the same thing with his new contract. Um, you know, there is a, there, there, there will be, um, I think the I think we're we're beginning to to ease away from this whole idea of a super agent, a very garrulous figure. Um, it's a it's a pretty refined process now, looking after the modern footballer. Um, I'm impressed. Um, a guy that that um, I featured in one of my other books, um, Alan Redman, now runs uh, Rock Nations Football Operations, and Alan is a very very smart guy. But also, he's a very, very socially conscious guy. He's 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 not the, you know, the Mister Ten Percent cliche that we've become used to over the last generation or two. And so, if you take Rock Nation as an example, in New York, they've got a uh, philanthropy. I, I, I knew I was going to get that word wrong. <laughs> philanthropy department um, in New York, uh, about fifteen people are working in it. And their role is to advise their clients, who by by definition are you know high high earning, hugely uh, visible sports uh, figures, on the best use of their charitable donations and, and and the social causes that they want to support. So again, there's it's a much more holistic thing. So you've got the business now where the De Bruyne's and the Sterling's. I think they will be followed by other by other players, um, basically don't need an agent anymore. We'll use two lawyers, analysts, because the thing about analysis is you can actually prove there is a figure that can be done or an algorithm that can be used to say, right, this is how I contribute to your football club, and this is the intrinsic worth of make that contribution. So it's changing massively, changing massively. How, how does it sort of work for, I suppose, then – bring it back to fans and the future and looking towards that. Take obviously Liverpool as a prime example. So much of the identity built off what Bill Shankly laid down at Liverpool, the socialist values that the club have with the city, whereas the success of the football team took the name of the, the team and the city around the world. And now, as we're sort of speaking about, that's being cashed in in terms of capitalism. So for the fans, whereas the people within football have that analytics field, as you're talking about, to help them move forward. For, for fans, for the identity of the club they support, and so it isn't sort of taken on by armchair fans and the fans the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. How, how, sort of, how does the future look for sort of your local fan? So Liverpool isn't just a name that's thrown around without sort of that identity from which it was built. It's interesting. I, I, you know, I think we're at the time of year, aren't we, where it's season ticket renewal time? It'd be interesting to see how many how many people have got one got the money and two the inclination to actually um, uh, renew season tickets uh, because there were certain clubs during the pandemic who behaved disgracefully. Uh, Newcastle United being probably the most prominent. Um, it is interesting. You know, Liverpool operate on almost like an emotional tightrope, don't they? Because the fans. Again, you know, we talked earlier on about the fans have latent power. They used it, didn't they, over ticket prices at, at Liverpool. They um, certainly objected to furloughing during the pandemic. They, they, they are very sensitive, uh, and I'm speaking as an outsider with complete respect here. They are sensitive to any slights on the Shankly legend, you know, or what he represents. And I think what he represents, it was, ve it's very strange because 
you know, I've been fortunate to meet, you know, some pretty extraordinary people. And with Shankly, um, you know, my, my pivotal game, which I write about in the book, was was as a ball boy. Uh, Watford beat uh, Liverpool 1-0 in the 1970 FA Cup quarterfinal. And that was the defeat which uh, caused Shankly to um, scrap his first grade team, first grade Liverpool team. And when I met him, I, I spoke to him about that, you know, as I had to. But it was funny, away from football and away from the football club, he seemed somehow diminished. He'd lost his spirit somehow. It was, just, it was a couple of weeks before he passed away. And I found that quite telling, really, that a football club um, does instill and, in, and infer power on individuals. And, you know, OK, so Klopp has got, Jurgen Klopp has, has had a huge emotional impact not just on the club but i'm guessing on the city as well and liverpool have got something special do they want to lose it by moving too far away from that i think it's it, as i say it's a juggling act that they've got to do i i would hope that liverpool for all their plans to monetize you know, but the brand and the badge and and the tradition that they don't forget who got them there in the first place and you know basically without the fans liverpool everton man united any club you care to mention without the fans do they do they truly exist probably don't not in this not in, certainly not in a spiritual sense and i still think I, I you know we talk about finance and commerce for me football isn't about pounds or dollars or yen or euros it's not about bricks and water it's actually about flesh and blood it's about people and that is the importance i think that perhaps because we've been detached from the, the humanity of football during the pandemic i think that probably you know, certainly for me anyway it's made me much more conscious of the fact that look i don't really give a damn about football finance Football to me is always going to be a human experience and players are human beings. You know, as a, as a little kid, as a ball boy, I was on the touchline and you, and this is why I was so enraptured by it and why I fell in love with football. You can see the fear in a player's eyes when he's, when he's injured. You know, you can see that thousand yard stare when they're walking off knowing that they're going to get an absolute rollicking in the dressing room at, at the end of a game they've lost unnecessarily you can hear the studs on a shin pad all that stuff that's real i'm and, and that's why hopefully anyone who reads this book will actually pick up on the fact that look this game we talk about money all the time but how valuable is money well actually compared to a little kid walking into the ground with his dad or his mum for the first time. Money is irrelevant, really. And I, I suppose just sort of final point to make, it is that for when fans are back in the ground, hopefully from the start of next season, it will be that, as you, you talk about there, that, that first moment when you walk up from the concourse up to the steps and you see the green pitch for the first time, it will be that reawakening of that love of the game for many people and fans realising the power that actually they do hold. Yeah, yeah, I, I, you know, I, one of the great touchstones, I think, uh, was the, the, the quote by Bobby Robson, you know, what is a football club? And the football club is, 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 is that, you know, he painted that picture of the young boy going with his dad and walking up the stairs, looking out onto the field, this floodlight field of dreams, if you like. But, um, that's what we've all missed. You know, even the you know, there's been some. I think there's been a, some extraordinary journalism over the last year, because you know the writers and the broadcasters, they've been working in a void as well. And um, I think you know, in our profession, we will welcome fans back as well. Might not be so easy to park anymore, but you know, it's it's a real it's it's something which. I think is a long it's it hope I hope it's a reawakening a reawakening for the game 
as it should be rather than the game as it might be if we don't watch out. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the book, then whose game is it anyway? Available from Pitch Publishing. You can find it online and in any good bookshop. It is out from Monday, the 19th of April. Michael, th- thanks a lot for uh, for joining us and thanks for your time. That's a pleasure. Enjoyed it. Thank you, Mike.